Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us today for the third uh, webinar in our Essentials series. Um, today's webinar is an educational session uh, discussing adhesive performance testing and how this information is reported on technical data sheets. Uh, we will also discuss the typical tests reported, including peel, tack, and shear, and how results from those tests can be influenced by the use of different backing materials. Um, if you have questions, we do have a chat box available. You can submit your questions anytime during the webinar, and we'll be sure to cover them at the end of the at the end of the session today. So just a brief introduction. Uh, my name is Janet Page. I'm the senior marketing manager. Um, I've been with MACTAC for 19 years, the last six of which have been in a marketing role supporting our industrial and medical tape business. And joining me today is Steve Schroff. And so I'll let Steve introduce himself. I'm Steve. I'm a business development chemist with MACTAC, the industrial products tape group. Most of my career has been spent in R&D. Recently, I moved to marketing, and uh, so I'm kind of leading the charge of these uh, webinars and some of our educational efforts in the field. I've been with MAGTAC going on 18 years now. Great. Uh, so now we'll cover just a little bit of background about, about MAGTAC. Uh, MAGTAC is roughly a $350 million company. We're based in Stowe, Ohio. Uh, in 2016, MAGTAC was acquired by the Lintec company based out of Tokyo, Japan. Um, our Stowe location is the North American headquarters for Lintec USA. Uh, the Lintec USA companies include MacTech, uh, Matico, who specializes in high-end window films, and VDI, specializing in metalized films. MacTech has a broad product portfolio, um, specializing in pressure-sensitive laminates for a wide range of markets and applications. Uh, we have a graphics division specializing in materials that are used in signage, wayfinding, fleet marking, window wall and floor graphic materials, all with many designed for wide format inkjet printing. Uh, we have an industrial and medical tape division. Um, Steve and I both represent that division where we have a number of products that are double coated, both foams and films. We specialize in transfer adhesives, single coated foam tapes, single coated films, bandage materials and a wound care line of products. Uh, we also have a sheets division um, and sheets basically focuses on cut sheets used in offset and digital printing. We've got narrow roll materials used for aqueous inkjet and UV inkjet printing. And we have a roll label division specializing in prime label materials, durable films, VIP printing, prime pa label papers and specialty materials. So again, MacTech, MacTech really covers the gamut of pressure sensitive laminates for all markets. Um, now I will turn the presentation over to Steve and he will start our discussion on performance testing for adhesives. OK, hello everyone. Hopefully everyone's staying safe out there. I just want to start off by saying happy December, everybody. Uh, for three quarters of the year, I think we were all sitting around wondering when this year is going to end and uh, we are in the home stretch here. So this will be our last uh, webinar for this year and then we'll start up early next year. So as Jana alluded to, I'm going to start off and uh, start talking about pressure sensitive adhesive testing. Uh, literally, there are hundreds of tests that could be performed on pressure sensitive adhesives and laminates. I think at MAGTAC, our CTM, our corporate test method database is about 250 tests strong, and I know we don't cover all the tests. Testing's done, you know, there's testing that is done through the research and development phase, uh, ongoing quality assurance, quality control support. The tests that are selected and driven, uh, or the selection of them are really driven by a number of factors here. The market, the application, the materials, and the purpose of the testing. Uh, so when you talk about market, with roll label products, you might measure the hydro expansivity of a product to uh, get an idea of what the lay flat would be, which is very important for a label. That wouldn't apply to graphics, however, you know, whether they're using vinyl, but they would test a lot of different print adhesions or maybe optical clarity because that's important to a graphics application. Whereas in uh, the industrial tapes that Jenna and I represent, we might be testing, testing SAFT, which would be applicable to the other two divisions. So there's a lot of testing out there uh, depending on the applications. There's a lot of adhesive specific testing, a lot of release specific testing. Again, sometimes the purpose in R&D, you're going to run a lot of different more uh, a lot more different varied tests when you're developing a product than say you would when you're doing quality control or maybe you're running a gamut of tests because there's uh 
there's a claim or an issue uh, versus just a regular old quality control kind of uh, monitoring the the uh, the performance of the product over time. So a lot of testing that can be done out there. Some of these tests include, and I'm not going to go through all these. Uh, quite literally, I teach a couple of different courses for PSTC in the spring and fall. Uh, various hour and a half long courses on a lot of these techniques. So there is a lot of information out there, but uh, some of these tests include the, you know, the higher tech spec spectroscopy, uh, the chromatographies, and you get into your mechanical properties, uh, DMA, elongation, tensiles, uh, and the more of your adhesion testing, peel tack, shear, mandrel. And what we're really going to focus on today is peel tack and shear. And specifically, what we're going to focus on is how it relates to data sheets and start covering that. So uh, I'm going to use our data sheet today. And the reason this has come up is, is that there's always been little idiosyncrasies between companies and data sheets. Everybody does things slightly different, even though there's standardized test methods. Uh, everything is a little different, but as of recently, in the last year or so, I've seen some very, very wild varying results and testing and reporting done throughout data sheets. So we thought it'd be a good time to just kind of level set, go through data sheets and testing and how it can be interpreted, manipulated, uh, and how it varies and what you can do about it to try and normalize some of the data. So looking at our product guide for uh, 1013, which I'll be using for uh, several uh, actual practical uh, studies that we did today. We use this product, but again, what you can expect to find across all data sheets, it's not MagTac, but everybody's would be, you know, you're going to find the part number. You're going to find a brief product description and some product construction data telling you what the construction is, the calipers, the thicknesses of materials, the web widths, uh, what it is, what it's used for, uh, what it does, what it's really good at, all that general type of data. Next thing you can expect to find would be uh, the actual, you know, adhesion properties or physical properties themselves. Uh, you can find some service temperature and then other properties. This might include chemical resistance, uh, immersion testing, flammability testing, uh, durability testing, you know, all, all kinds of things there. It just depends on the product in the market, but these are all pretty generic and this is what you can really find on a data sheet. Now, digging into this, we're going to start digging into this piece by piece, and we're going to start with peel adhesion. Peel adhesion is probably the most common known uh, property of tape. Uh, everyone's always had to peel a piece of tape, so that seems to be the one that resonates the most with people. Uh, just going to define peel here. Peel is the force per unit width required to break the bond between a pressure sensitive adhesive and the surface at which it's been applied to when you're peeling back the adhesive. Uh, peel is what you use to measure the ultimate adhesion or the final adhesion of it. Now, granted, various adhesives attain their ultimate adhesions at very different time intervals. A rubber will usually get to its ultimate adhesion sooner than, say, an acrylic, but you don't use a quick tack to measure the ultimate adhesion. You use a peel. So as I zoom in here on the peel section of our data sheet, uh, I'll start to pull out that uh, one thing is, is that Peels have a lot of variabilities that can really influence the results of the test. And again, even when you're following standardized test methods, there still is a lot of variability in there. And to complicate things more, there's four or five different standardizing testing uh, regulatory uh, services out there. There's ASTM, there's JIS, there's PSTC, uh, there's AFRA. I mean, there's a lot of different even standardized tests among the standardized testing. So it can get quite confusing and see some varied results. So, you know, one thing to look for is always what was the dwell? As I'll cover here, peels very uh, dependent on the dwell time or how long it's had the bond. Uh, the surface that's used. Now, typically, everyone for data sheets using stainless steel for some applications, uh, we do a variety of different surfaces that might commonly get stuck to. Uh, here, I just circled the, the some of the plastics, but up above there, we have stainless steel. Uh, the units that are there, and I'll cover a lot about units because, boy, units are starting to vary pretty wildly. Uh, ours are pretty generic. Uh, or pretty common to North America, nothing too exotic here, pounds per inch or ounces per inch. And then one area where, you know, you start to see your first trip up here, your trap is, what was the backing material? 
here, you know, we have a two mil backed and a dead soft aluminum backed. And uh, one of the reasons why I'm really calling to this in the first area of focus here for this webinar will be uh, backing is really an easy way to, uh, nice way to put it would be to massage the data, if you will. Backing has a large effect. So I did a little study here and we're going to start with 180 degree peel. And what the 180 degree peel is, is that you're laminating the adhesive to a panel uh, usually stainless steel, if you want to compare adhesives, stainless steel is the most consistent uh, uh, substrate that everybody can get, so we use stainless steel. And what you're doing is you're laminating to it and you're flipping it over 180 degrees and you're peeling it upward. This is the 180 degree peel. And in this study, again, we used IR IF 1013. Uh, this is a free film, so one thing about backing is, is you might be wondering well, why is backing used? Well, in this case, the only way that you can test the peel of a free film is to back it with some material so that it has something to stick to. Uh, again, then when you're doing double coated products, you can't have that exposed adhesive, especially if you're doing 180 degree. Uh, you're going to want to release, uh, put peel off the release liner, especially if you're doing the other side, and the adhesive would stick to itself as it's going up. And you, you might not even get a result. You might max out what the lower cell on the instron can handle. So you always got to put some kind of backing there to keep the adhesive from sticking to itself or to give it some type of rigidity or something they adhere to in, this, in the case of a free film, which we're testing here. So just to keep this in mind for every all the data I'm going to show you, and it's going to be quite interesting to see how much this varies. Uh, all these uh, results were generated from the same exact six inch sample roll of material. So really no lot to lot variability here. It all came from the same roll, same cut, same lane, same drop of the master roll. So little chance of variability there. Everything was tested by the same technician on the same machine on the same day. And at the end of this, I'll start covering how some of this varies. Uh, and the same cleaning procedure was used on the same batch of panels. So tried to keep this all the outside variables as constant as possible. And then we start looking here. So in this uh, study, what I did was I had a half mil PET backing, a one mil PET backing, a two mil PET, a four mil PET, and then I went into some foils, 1.8 mil foil, 3.6 mil, eight mil foil. So testing a half mil. So half mil PET typically is not used as a backing because Half mil PET, it's so flimsy, it's kind of pain in the butt to handle by hand. However, if you're testing the first pass of a double coated product and a half mil carrier, it actually gets used a lot. But uh, applying it by hand, it's it's a pain. Uh, you get wrinkles. I, I don't even try to deal with it. So, but we we uh, you know people better in the lab than me did this testing for me. And so we're going to look at the half mil PET. And you know, half mil PET, we get about 180 degree. Oh, I'm sorry, with 180 degree peels, we get. 8.7 pounds of peel. Now let's go and double that backing. We get you know, a slight increase, a little thicker backing. We got a higher peel. Then we jump up to a 2 mil PET and we get a significant increase. And again, keep in mind that the only thing that's changing here is the backing. Jump up again, 4 mil PET, 15.2 pounds. So we've almost you know, just shy of double the peel just by changing the backing. Now keep in mind the actual force to break the bond isn't changing. You know, the force to break the bond between the adhesive and the stainless steel panel that we used isn't changing. What is changing though is the force that the Instron is reading and that is a result of the backing, not the adhesive itself. Nothing's changed. Again, same roll, same material, same lot, same technician, same panel, same machine, same day. The only thing changing here is the backing. Jump up to the foils. Oops, sorry, I went backwards. Jump up to the foils, and we get, you know, a almost uh, just shy of two mil foil, 14.3 pounds, 3.6 mil. You get a little heavier, and then an eight mil. You know, you're, you're up around 17 pounds of peel. So, quite a large variance of data there, just by the backing itself. And the problem is, is that on data sheets. You see one mil PET, you'll see a two mil PET, you'll see foils, you'll see a two mil dead soft foil, you'll see a, a four mil foil. Uh, you got to pay attention to what's really being used there. Uh, unfortunately, when it comes to different backings that's being used, there's really no conversion. It's not possible to extrapolate what the data was. So somebody comes to me and says, yeah, we use two mil PET for our data sheet, but uh, that mining company in northern US is using two mil foil. 
yeah, there's not really any way of uh, correlating between that data. And the other thing is, is that trying to avoid too much detail. And I got a phone call. Forgot to disable my phone. Sorry there. Uh, this adhesive fails cohesively, so various adhesives are going to re react even more drastically to various types of backing. So something that doesn't fail cohesively, uh, some of our acrylics but fail that are really stiff and fail co or adhesively, uh, they'll have even a bigger effect by changing the backing. So what can be done? Well, another thing we can do here is we can change the peel angle and peel angle is a variable. Some people report 180 degree, some people report 90 degree. Uh, on the bottom here, the bottom graphic is, uh, so the top graphic is 180 degree peel. Now we're just doing a 90, we're forming an L, we're changing the orientation of the panel, and uh, we're making a, a giant basic L shape here and peeling it up at 90 degrees. So we're gonna look, so we have the uh, 180 degree peel on top, and now I'm gonna start filling in the 90 degree peel. Half mil backing, you get about 7.4 pounds jump up to the 1.8 mil, or I'm sorry, the one mil backing, you get 8.8 pounds, two mil backing, 9.7, four mil, 10.2, jump over to the foils, 8.3 pounds, uh, double that again with the foil, you get about 8.9 pounds, and up to the eight mil foil, you get about 10.7 pounds. Again, nothing with the adhesive here has changed. The adhesive still has the same force it takes to break the bond, the only thing that's changed is how is the load cell on the instrument receiving and recording its data? That's what's changing here. The force to break that bond is still the same, but the force that's recorded by the instrument is different. And these are all variables that can change that. You have 180 degree peel, and then what we normally see is 90 degree peels are less than 180 degree. They're not half, so there is no correlation there. Uh, but the one thing you will notice, and if you plot these out and do a trend line, what you'll see is, is that one of the benefits of a 90 degree peel is, 90 degree peels do help reduce the effect of the backing. It kind of normalizes the data. You don't get as large and as drastic as jumps uh, from the backing. And the reason why the backing here is really adding to it is, is that the instron is the load cell is measuring the force it takes to break the bond between the adhesive and the stainless steel panel, but then it's also measuring the force it takes to, to fold back and bend that polyester backing or that foil backing. So the instron is kind of measuring two forces at once. It's measuring the adhesive force and it's measuring essentially the stiffness or the rigidity of the backing material that's used. And when you do it at 180 degrees, you get a much larger effect than you do at a 90 degree. So when we have thick backing, sometimes we have to test final products or what our products been laminated to as peels. Sometimes 180 is out of the question. You have to use 90. And that is really to kind of normalize the data and uh, get something that's meaningful out of uh, out of the data versus say, uh, you know, trying to do 180 on an eighth inch foam, you would have to do a 90 degree. That's just entirely too thick. Again, it doesn't matter if you're doing 180 or 90 degree, there's really no conversion that's really possible between the different thicknesses of backing. So uh, another thing here is uh, the width on PO adhesion. So I have here highlighted that everything we did is an inch in width. So it's pounds per inch in width or ounces an inch per width. Uh, something I've seen recently is, is that People, uh, especially a lot of offshore tapes, are really starting to change with the width. It's, it's starting to play havoc. Uh, one of the nice things is, is that width is a linear effect on peel, so you can account for it. But one thing you got to look at, so I had a, a sales rep of ours calling the customers like, hey, we want to, we're comparing your tape to something we're getting offshore. Their adhesive is, you know, it's got double the peel that yours does. We don't think it's real, but we just don't understand why. What's the discrepancy between the two data sheets? So, uh, you know, the first thing I'm asking is, well, you know, it, how thick's the adhesive? Well, it's the same thickness. Okay, it's the same thickness, and you're saying they're getting close to 30 pounds. In this case, it was 30 pounds of adhesive. And I had a really raised eyebrow there because our XT is about as high a peel as you can get out of a PSA. And, uh, you know, especially at that coat weight. So I had like the Dwayne The Rock Johnson eyebrow there, and I just really kind of questioned this. So he got me the data sheet and I looked, and sure enough, they're measuring the peel across the entire width of tape, 
which in this case was 3.9375 inches, so almost four inches wide. I'm like, well, any wonder, you know, yeah, their, their peel is double our value, but the width that they're using is four times our width. So one nice thing is, is that roughly it's linear. And I did a, a, a little testing here where I just took a two mil PET, which is our, our common backing. And then I just changed the width. I went from one inch, which is 13.5, and I just went to an inch and a half. And that jumps it all the way up to 21.2. Uh, I've seen lower width widths. I've seen a lot higher widths used. Uh, it's just something to be cognitive of, of that a lot of people are changing the widths here. So when you look at the units, uh, North America, most common unit is pounds per inch or ounces per inch. Uh, it's a simple conversion. There's 16 ounces per pound. So, you know, if you're reporting in pounds, you want to convert it to ounces, you times by 16, vice versa, you divide by 16 if you want to go the other way. Another common uh, unit when you're dealing with uh, Europe is uh, newtons per 25 millimeters or newtons 0.2.5 centimeters. That's kind of an easy 10 millimeters per centimeter, so they're the same thing. Uh, when you're dealing with newtons and you want to convert to pounds or vice versa, the conversion factor is 4.4. Uh, again, where it gets a little dicey or where it can get confusing is, uh, and the nice thing is, is that width is approximately linear, is I'm seeing a lot of newtons per 10 millimeters, newtons per centimeter, newtons per 15 millimeters. And this is even in some of the standardized testing, uh, you know, the new Harmon, uh, Harmon, the Harmony spec, I would say, uh, that they're going to put out where they're trying to blend all the aspects of the different testing standardized agencies. They want to do newtons per 100 millimeters, which is roughly four inches wide again. So it's like, well, we've always done an inch. So there's a lot of variability out there in terms of width. You just have to look for it and really understand what it is on the data sheet that they're trying to report. Is it an inch in width? Is it something different? It's got to be converted. Uh, again, sometimes with backings, they can't be converted, unfortunately. So peel adhesion influencers, I'm kind of covering this one. This doesn't necessarily relay, or I'm sorry, uh, relate to, I mean, it does relate to technical data sheets, but the reason why I'm covering this is, is that we have a lot of customers who like to do their own testing, and then they're always wondering why their testing doesn't necessarily uh, come in line with ours. So. Peel force is a function of, so I'm going to go through a lot of things and a lot of the variables that can change the peel force. And uh, I can't tell you how many times, you know, a customer's come to us and said, you know, we're, we're, we see your data, we see what you're reporting, it just doesn't line up with ours. And then we start going through all these and we start finding the discrepancies. First thing is the rate of peel. One thing I have not seen so far, thank goodness, uh, is, is that the rate of peel has not been varied uh, amongst all the different testing that's out there and report it. So right now the standard is 12 inches per minute or 300 millimeters per minute. There are times for very specific uh, applications where you might want to speed it up or you might want to slow it down. But for QC purposes and for the purposes of keeping everything standard, 12 inches per minute is, is the uh, is the standard. If you speed up the rate, the peel will go up, and if you slow down that rate, the peel will go down. They are directly uh, related to each other. Angle of peel, we kind of showed you what that was, 90 degrees versus 180. Uh, another one that's out there, I won't say it's common, but you know, you can technically do a peel at any angle. I see some people do 120 degrees because that's been determined that if you were to peel off a piece of tape with your hand, it's about 120 degrees. That's mainly because Usually you grab it with your uh, index finger and your thumb and then you use the bottom of your hand as kind of a lever and that makes a 120 degree angle. Not really commonly reported, 90 and 180. 180 by far is the most popular, followed by 90. Dwell time, uh, that's how long you let it dwell. So we typically report 30 minutes and 24 hours. Those are the two most common times, but I've seen five minutes, I've seen 10 minutes, I've seen 15 minutes. And then, you know, sometimes we'll do 72 hours a week. Uh, depending on the adhesive, you may or may not see a difference. With rubbers, because they typically wet out so much faster, you don't see a lot of difference between the 12 times. With acrylics, you can see uh, very varied, wild, drastic swings in the peel result just based off of dwell time. So if you're, you know, again, try to keep your, if you want to do QA testing on your incoming raw material, try to keep your dwell time, your angle, your rate, everything constant with the vendor. Uh, one area where I see a lot of people trip up is application pressure. So 
pretty much across all the different testing rig uh, agencies uh, or standardized testing agencies out there is a uh, it's about a 2.04 kilogram weight which is just over 4.4 pounds why they decided on 2.04 kilograms i have no idea but that is the weight that is used uh, some people just have a standard roller and they just use hand pressure uh, that they make out there is a weighted roller or the, the rolling wheel itself weighs 4.4 pounds and it's on a uh, kind of an axle that, that can float. So really you're incapable of applying any additional pressure or they make automated machines and you know the application pressure, but then it's also dependent on the application time. So the standard here is a uh, 10 millimeters per second, two passes. So a lot of this plays into pressure sensitive tapes. Uh, when you're testing, these are all things you have to keep you know, in mind to keep it uh, consistent. Substrate, that's basically what you're testing to, stainless steel, HDPE, LDPE, things like that. Adhesive thickness, that's always going to change. The uh, thicker the adhesive, the better it's going to wet out of the surface and get higher back peels. Temperature and humidity, standard conditions for testing is 72F, 50% RH. So, uh, so those are the things that are actually built into the peel that could change it. Other things that can influence it, as I showed, is backing. Now, the one thing I'll notice is, is that when you see my backing, uh, the data from the backing, you know, you kind of got a big jump from one mil to two mil uh, PET. And the reason there is, is that, you know, I used what backing I had handy here, but, you know, PET has different thicknesses and different stiffnesses. So if I wanted to do this in real scientific measures, and we've done this before from a QA, QC standpoint and validating test methods, you'd use the same grade of polyester across all thicknesses because polyester actually does vary quite a bit in stiffness between, say, Melnex 453, 454, Mylar 2000J, things like that. They do vary a lot, and it does indeed throw off peel. Operator, always always little idiosyncrasies in each operator who's doing it. The instrument, we, we have all instrons, but even then, you know, one instron might give a little different result than another. Panels, another big place where I see people get tripped up, uh, you know, across all the different standardized testings. I'm gonna go forward here so you can see the different standardized methods that are used just for peel. Uh, number 302 or number 304, uh, stainless steel, bright annealed finish. Uh, you know, there's very specific grades of steel that are used. Can't tell you how many times I've gone into a place and they don't use the right panels, they don't use the right steel. Uh, their panels are destroyed, all kinds of scratches on there. Uh, and they might not even be clean in our places, cleaning procedure. So our cleaning procedure is actually quite in depth. We use a toluene or MK to remove all adhesive residue. And then we hit it with diacetone wash until there's no streaks. And then after the diacetone wash, we follow up with three acetone washes to wash off the diacetone. And if you have any streaks or ghosting prominent, you do it again. And if you have anything after that, you throw the panel away. Uh, again, you know, we get all of our panels from Chem instruments, I believe. Yeah, uh, the standardized equipment. And there are baking procedures. You got to actually break in panels. Uh, we actually have to use Formula 409 to get off all the industrial uh, lubricants that were used during the polishing. So, another area where if you're testing in your lab and you can never figure out why you never quite line up with maybe somebody else's, these are all the factors that line up in it just for peel itself. Loop tack, a lot of what applies for PO applies for loop tack, so I won't go into as much depth there. Uh, what loop tack is, is the property of the PSA that allows it to adhere to a surface under very slight pressure. What you're really doing here is measuring how instantaneously the adhesive grabs. Uh, there is no lamination pressure here. Basically, you're making, as, it, as uh, the name suggests, a loop out of the tape. You make a loop, you stick it into the, uh, the clamps, the jaws of the machine, it comes down and just the weight of itself essentially touching the block and it's a one inch by one inch block or one inch by one inch piece of panel there uh that's all it has to wet out and that's what you're measuring there there are other methods they include the probe tack and rolling ball tack uh rolling ball is probably one of my favorite ones that one to me is like an engineer one day decided to let his kid make up a test method and he was going through a matchbox car phase 
it reminds me of those little like tracks and ramps you drive your matchbox cars down because it is literally a little ramp you put a ball bearing on it and you have the tape at the bottom of the ramp and you let it roll down and then you measure how far it rolls across the tape so something really sticky like duct tape probably doesn't roll too far something like painter's tape the ball might roll off the end of the table uh, as you can see it's quite variable not very reproducible the values don't mean much we went to uh, loop tack as the universal kind of testing property for uh, for tack probe tack is uh, something that's just got a little probe as it suggests it just comes up touches the tape and pulls it down my previous employer we used to call the probe tack the random number generator so almost everybody here really uses and reports quick tack uh, or loop tack as the quick tack result so and as I mentioned, same factors, uh, factors affecting PO also affect quick tax. So did the same thing here, and we're just going to go through kind of quickly here what the backing does. So get a big jump between one mil, half mil to one mil, one mil to two mil, put in the four mil there. Just kind of going through. It's the foils now. And there we go. So. Uh, as you can imagine, the stiffer the backing, the higher the quick tack will be here because one thing you remember is if it's a stick, stiffer backing, it's going to press that adhesive onto that plate much, uh, much better. You're going to get much more contact. Again, you know, with a uh, with a quick tack, you're not doing any lamination. So the only way to really make contact with the surface is to have the tape itself, you know, when it's being lowered, push out and really try to wet out that surface. Foils here, they can be a little tricky. Uh, the one thing about foils is, is that they can bend very easily. And so when you put them in the jaws, you get all kinds of creases and crinkles and it doesn't always quite wet out as much. So you would think that foil might follow the same pattern as peel, which is give higher quick tax. And that is really dependent on, you know, are you using a soft foil, stiff foil, how wrinkled is it? Again, when you're laminating everything down with a roller, at least you're getting it nice, flat, and consistent. So, uh, and again, you know, there's really no reason to use foil as a backing for peel and tack. Again, just real quick, width plays into it just as it does for uh, peel. So, slightly wider uh, width for a quick tack is going to give a much drastic, drastically larger uh, result for quick tack, just as it did for peel. Going to cover shear testing here. So shear is the adhesive ability is the adhesive's ability to resist static forces across the adhesive in the same plane as the backing, basically forcing the materials to slide over one another. I have a, a diagram here if you're not familiar with the shear, but you basically bond uh, the adhesive to a plate and then hang away a weight from it, and then you just measure how long it takes to fall. So looking at our data sheet again, I'm going to pull out two things here, a kilogram and five pounds. One of the key factors here is how much weight are you hanging from the shear? Uh, and then the hours to failure, basically trying to interpret what that result means. So uh, one thing is, is that one kilogram is the typical weight that's used, although I do see lo lower. I've seen 500 grams used at room temperature. Uh, when you start getting in the elevated temperature shears, you see even lower than that, 250. Uh, the one thing is, is that the lower the weight, the longer the shear will be. Inversely, the higher the weight, the shorter the shear will be, or how long it takes for it to fall. So, typical size is pretty consistent at an inch by an inch. Uh, I have seen half inch by half inch, and I have seen my previous employer, we used to do quarter inch by quarter inch. I would say those are far in the minority at least everyone is kind of doing one inch by one inch. I haven't seen anything larger than that reported for shear. Uh, if I'm going to see a lot of variability in shear testing, it's going to be on the weight that's hung, not necessarily on the size, uh, the size of the sample. So most people use a kilogram uh, at MACTAC because our adhesives are so high in cohesive strength. We actually have to go up to five pounds. In some cases, we go up to 10 pound weights just to try and get them to fail. So uh what is the result and understanding why people put the plus there honestly i can't speak on behalf of anybody else i can speak on behalf of MACTAC and what i've seen so basically if your result is over about 200 to 250 hours then what the plus means is that the sample doesn't fall uh 
obviously, you know, shear banks, 300 hours is quite a long time. There's only a certain number of shear banks. I'm sure everybody else's lab faces the same problems as our labs, which is there's never a shear bank open because they always hang. So what happens is, is that normally for us, it's 300 hours unless you forget about it. But at 300 hours, we just take down the PO and we say it doesn't, uh, I'm sorry, we take down the shear and just say it doesn't fail. Uh, and then we put a plus at the end of it. What you have seen though is, is that, you know, if it's under 200 hours, then you know you'll see something like 85 plus hours that usually means is that well it failed about the average was about 85 hours uh the one thing is that some of this does stem from the fact that shear testing is a very high, uh, variable test there is a large discrepancy between data uh even in the same adhesive you can get you know 20 30 40 hours is quite common uh, on, on something, you know, that 85 hours, you know, you might get something up to 150, you might get something as low as 40. So what we typically do, and what I find with most companies out there and, and benchmarking their products is, is that they'll take the average and then they'll put a plus uh, after it. So if they say 85, then the average is about 85 hours a year. Uh, when you get really high numbers like 500 or 200, anything above 200, usually the plus there doesn't mean it fell at 200. It just means that at 200 hours, we got sick, we needed space, we got sick of waiting, we just took it down and says it doesn't fail. And chances are it doesn't. So, uh, thing here again, if you're going to see uh, changes in weight, there's really no good uh, correlation that can be made between varying weights. If you double the weight, you don't necessarily have the amount of time that it takes to fall. Uh, conversely, if you reduce the weight by half, you don't double how long it takes to fall either. There's really no good correlation there. In terms of area, there is a very rough directional correlation. So if we're doing a one by one and somebody's doing a half inch by half inch, yeah, maybe about double the amount of time, but uh, very loose there, certainly you know, only directionally speaking, can you get ideas there. You can't make a good correlation, but there at least is a better correlation between area than there is between the weights that are being used. So, uh, factors that influence the shear test, adhesion. Uh, this is one thing where, this is one area where peel, peel testing is very controlled on how you bond the peel, uh, the tape to the panel. You wanna get a good result. For shear, this is one area where you can really laminate it as many times as you take. Maybe you let it dwell. Maybe you put it in the oven and let it dwell. The whole purpose here is, is that the shear, the sample should fail cohesively. And what that means is that the adhesive should split from itself so that when the shear does fall, it should not have popped off or fell off the panel. There should be adhesive residue left on the panel. There should be adhesive residue left on the, uh, on the substrate that was used. Uh, usually it's backed with polyester. Uh, again, this is for people that are doing their own testing there. Really here, this is one area where you can cheat a little, if you will, and uh, really try and get that adhesive to stick as well as you can to the panel because, again, you're not measuring the force of peel. You want to measure the cohesive failure, and therefore you want to make sure it's really bonded there. Uh, again, allow for ample dwell time. For rubbers, 24 hours should be plenty. For acrylics, you might want to let them go 72 hours, or you might want to throw them in the oven. You just want to make sure that adhesive gets and makes this intimate contact, gets as best wet out as it can on that panel. The weight, again, weight really di dictates what the shear value is going to be. So when you're doing data sheet comparisons, you really got to watch at what the, the weight is. Some people are reporting 500 grams, some people are reporting one kilogram. <coughs> Sample area, again, how big the area was. Alignment on panels, a key one if you're doing your own testing. Uh, it's very critical that you make sure everything's lined up perfectly. If you get a cockeyed or crooked, well then you're not really measuring shear anymore. You're measuring what we call a slow peel. You're gonna get a much drastic, uh, much more drastic result because it's not, th that stress isn't being applied evenly across that one inch by one inch. It's, it's starting at one corner and working its way up to the other if it's crooked on the panel. Sure, and humidity again should always be done at 72 degrees uh, 50 RH unless you're doing a SAF temperature and you know some people might have heard of SAF but not know what it is but SAF stands for as an acronym shear adhesion fail temperature uh, basically what it is is that you're putting a shear 
testing bank into an oven. And what the SAFT is, is that you're slowly, after you hang your shears, you close the door, you turn it on, you run the program, and this oven slowly ramps up the temperature to say, you know, from room temperatures, say 450, 500 maybe, you know, you can set the high end wherever you want. Typically it's 450. And what you're doing is you're, you're recording the temperature at which your sample falls. Uh, it's really a way of determining the uh, temperature resistance of an adhesive, at least under load. Uh, lower weights here are almost always used. Uh, 500 grams even is too much. So you see a lot of people doing 250 or 100 gram weights. Another way this can vary is if you see this on uh, data sheets, the weight can vary, but then the ramp can the ramp can vary. So what I say the ramp is, is that standard programs are really one degree every two minutes, but in two minutes, nothing really has time to ever come to steady state. So you get a much higher SAF temperature. So what some of us do uh, is we ramp it up one degree every five minutes, and that allows everything to come to steady state. And you find a much lower SAF temperature if you use that second that second uh, test protocol there where you ramp it up slower. Uh, an alternative to SAF would be using elevated shear temperature. That is, say, you just put, you know, you set the oven instead of setting at the ramp, you turn it to 200 degrees, you let everything come to temperature, you just throw your SAF in there, uh, I'm sorry, your shear in there, and then you're measuring a standard shear, but you're doing it at a, at a higher elevated temperature, and then you're recording how long it takes to fall. So, uh, that kind of concludes where we're at, and that does conclude where we're at for, for technical data sheets. However, since it is December, we're going to give you a little Christmas present here. We got some bonus material, uh, something on a webinar that's coming up, but I get asked a lot about shear testing, and my personal opinion is, is that I don't like shear testing at all. I think it's a very overrated property. It's good for QA purposes and QC purposes, but for actually seeing what it's going to do in the real world. and try to predict actual product performance on real world applications, I actually think shooters terrible. And so what I've been doing is I have a test now that we do and we're calling this holding power. Uh, we do a separate test internally, we call it holding power. And really the problem here is, is that shear measures the resistance to deform deformation in plane or parallel with gravity. That is the weight hangs directly below. Uh, and I have a picture here. Uh, that's what the circles are showing is that that weight is directly below the tape. The problem is, is that in the real world, ob objects have depth or curves. Uh, I have curves too, especially. So definitely in the real world, objects have curves or they have some depth to them. Uh, really, when you look at mounting and bonding, the, the, the key here to success is slow peel resistance. Uh, the slow peel that I was mentioning before, this resistance, the slow constant force that makes you want to peel off. So, you know, when I talk about real worlds having uh, objects having depth, our favorite example is a soap dispenser hanging on the wall. Or when they, we say they have curves, uh, is this heating duct. And you know, when you're going around a convex or a concave, it's not necessarily tough unless you're trying to say bond a foam around a curve and the foam or the plastic has some type of memory. Then it's gonna to wanna to spring back and go back to its original shape. And the problem is, is that shear doesn't really do a good job of predicting. So when you look at all the stresses out there, so you have shear stress and certainly in real world, you have a lot of applications where shear stress is applied but you also have a lot more where tensile stress is applied or cleavage, or what we really see is, is that all three of them can be applied at once. So these are your different types of stresses. So when you go back and look at these different pictures, then if you look at the soap dispenser, you have both shear, the weight of the entire dispenser pulling down, but because it has depth, you now have a moment of inertia. So you have rotational motion. So those arrows at the top are pulling away. And if you look at this soap dispenser, you can actually see if you look at it where it connects to the wall, the top is slightly pulling away compared to the bottom. So at the bottom, you have compression and at the top, you have cleavage. And then this is exacerbated by the fact that, you know, you usually pump from the bottom to get the soap. So it's, it's not a true shear test. And really we develop our holding power test because of soap dispensers. And what we found is, is that when we keep hanging shears and this adhesive has a really high shear, but it's terrible at holding these soap dispensers. This other adhesive doesn't have as high a shear, but it does much better. And then we did some testing and we really found a way to correlate that and better understand it. 
uh, looking over the two curved surfaces here, when you have the convex and concave, you know, if you have a rigid foam and you're going around a concave, the center is going to want to pop out. That it's going to want to go back to its original shape, and the center is going to pop out. And if you go to the convex, the edges are going to want to lift up. Again, shear doesn't really count or account for uh, real world applications. So adhesives that have high shear do terrible around curved surfaces and might not hold that soap dispenser very well. Uh, so what we do have is a test. Now I can't go into too much detail because we do call uh, hold it pri pri proprietary here at MacTac, but it's something we call holding power. And I put holding power parentheses because some people refer to shear as holding power. And I just don't, I, I think shear is shear. And I think holding power is more related to real world type uh, activities here. But I want to show a little something here. So. Uh, we took a high shear acrylic, uh, one of the old ones we used to go up against. This is a solvent acrylic, uh, has a lot of shear. It will hold a one kilogram weight for well over 300 hours. You know, we took the test down. Uh, we even hold a five pound weight for quite a while. Then we took our 593 XT, which we know has a lot of shear. It's over 300 plus hours. Then we took our MP555, which if uh, anybody came to our booth at uh, Foam Expo a couple of years ago, we actually hung a 25 pound weight shear from the 555. That's how much shear it has. But all these will hold a one kilogram weight forever. But when you start doing slow peel, and I can't go into too much detail, but I'll give you an idea. The slow peel is essentially taking a normal type of peel, turning it upside down, and instead of using an inch drawn to peel away, you just hang a weight from it. And then you just measure how long it takes that weight to peel away. Now, I can't tell you exactly the size or the angle or the weight, uh, but that's essentially how we test slow peel is you, you turn it upside down, you take the tail, you apply a weight to it, and you just measure how it falls. And there are certain weights and angles that really predict this. It's not necessarily perfectly up and down, but I can't disclose what that is. But what you'll find here is, is that well, gee, that high shear acrylic gives you about 7.4 pounds of slow peel. Well, I don't know, is that any good? Well, not compared to the 593 XT. Now, granted, these both have about the same shear. They both hold one kilogram shear forever, and they both hold a five kilogram shear for about the same amount of time. Slight advantage to the XT, uh, but not a huge difference, but there is a huge difference in slow peel. And then you look at something like the uh, MP555 and you get a thousand hours. We took it down, it never even failed, it never even moved. Uh, in fact, we started looking at it, we were like, well, maybe we should measure how far it creeps. And so we're starting to look at just measuring the actual amount that it peels down since it never fails. Uh, but there's a big difference here. And what we find is, is that in reverse order here, 555 will hold a soap dispenser forever. And you can use a lot less tape to hold it up than say 593, than say that high uh, performance shear. So or that high shear acrylic, that high performance acrylic with the high shear. So uh, just kind of a little taste here. You know, I covered shear and I covered how it relies to the data sheet, but just giving you an idea that, you know, it's not really a good predictor for real world properties. And we're going to do a webinar here in the future next year uh more about real world holding power mounting and bonding and how this slow peel phenomenon really plays in so uh let janet kind of wrap it up here all right thanks Hi. steve that was a that was a great session um what i'd like to do now is just take a few minutes to answer some of the questions that have come in over the live chat during the webinar um, if there are any other questions that our listeners have, um, feel free to email uh, into us. Uh, you can contact your sales rep directly, or you can contact Steve or myself directly um, with any other additional questions you might have. Um, in the meantime, uh, question number one is, don't most single and double coated tapes utilize PET as a carrier? And therefore, shouldn't we as, customer, as a customer want to see performance data utilizing a PET backing? Well, most double coats do use a, a polyester carrier. They use a half mill. Uh, and again, I'm not saying don't use a backing. What I'm saying is, is that backing does kind of contribute to variability. And in order to test a double sided product, a lot of times you have to use a backing. Uh, the key is here, and the key for testing is really consistency. So on our end, we use the same backing consistently or else it will vary. Uh, but we can't control, say, what us and our competitors use in terms of a backing. But when you're looking and evaluating data sheets, you got to look at the backing and kind of get an idea of what who's using what. The reason why I think so, 
when you do a SAF temperature, a SAF test, you use aluminum foil as the backing. And the reason why is, is that once you get up around 450, polyester is going to melt. Other than that, there's really no reason to use foil for anything in terms of peel or quick tack. Uh, I heard once that the reason why that mining company uses foil was because polyester distorts. And I really have the Dwayne The Rock Johnson eyebrow about that one because I'm just like, even a half mil polyester isn't going to stretch. And so I'm bringing this up because a lot of customers, a lot of people, when they evaluate, and there's a lot of adhesives to screen, the first thing they might do is go through data sheets and just look at the peel value and and, and determine what adhesives they want to look at based off of peel. And the one thing here is, is that, well, you know, you might be throwing away a good adhesive just because they didn't use as thick of a backing as, say, somebody else. You know, you might select an adhesive that has actually pretty poor peel data, but they used a two mil foil instead of a one mil polyester. I hope that answers the question. Uh, yes, everybody should, you, you have to back your samples in a lot of cases. Great, thank you, Steve. Uh, the next question we have is, what does dynamic shear measure and is that more valuable than static shear testing? Uh, so we also test dynamic shear. You don't see dynamic shear on data sheets a lot. I think, it, Dynamic shear is essentially a, a shear test. It's set up just like a static shear, except for instead of uh, letting a weight hang there, what, you, what you're actually doing then is you're putting it in an instron and you're peeling the two away, but you're peeling a two away at, you know, if you have a 180, this would actually be a zero degree angle. So you're setting it up and you're still measuring the cohesive strength of the adhesive. You're just doing it at a much higher rate of speed. I find it a little bit more useful than a static shear. Uh, the data certainly is not nearly as variable. The data is much more uh, consistent, much tighter. Uh, you can do a little bit more analysis. So like when we do DOEs, sometimes we use static, or I'm sorry, dynamic shear because we can get a better design of experiment there. Uh, in terms of real world, again, the problem is, is that everything's perfectly in plane. And in real world, objects have depth. And so in terms of real world, I'm more of a fan of the slow peel test, uh, which is certainly not a widely known test because it's, you know, we're designing it as we go. Uh, but certainly I do think dynamic shear is more useful than a static shear. Wonderful. Okay, thank you, Steve. Uh, the next question we have is, what determines when you would use a 180 degree peel versus a 90 degree peel? Uh, mostly it's to, again, I, I kind of covered this a bit, normalize what the construction and or backing might be. Uh, one good example for this is right now we have some roofing projects going on and some of these roofing membranes can be 17, 25. We even have one that's up to 60 mils. Trying to measure a peel on something that thick or like I said, an eighth inch foam and doing 180 degrees would be a disaster. So the best way to do it there would be a 90 degree peel. Uh, 180 degrees are a little bit more consistent from a machine. Uh, when you do a 90 degree peel, you actually have to slide the panel so it stays perfectly under the jaw. So there's a bit of art to it as much as there is science. But sometimes you got to do the 90 degree because the material, either the, the facing material, what you're sticking to, or the backing material just dictates that it's just too thick. And the only way to really get a good peel would be a 90 degree. Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, the final question that we have uh, for this series is, uh, is there a best backing material to use for testing peel, tack, and static shear? No, not per se. I mean, consistency is the key. I would say though, my favorite would be a one mil or a two mil PET because they're easy to handle. Like I said, a half mil could be hard to handle. Uh, but one mil, two mil PET, everyone's going to have that. If you go any thicker than that, it actually starts becoming more exotic. A one mil or a two mil PET is going to be very common. Everybody should have that. Uh, you know, if you're testing in your place, other tape manufacturers, it's very common. It's readily available. Uh, those would be my suggestion, but really consistency is key. So if you're testing internally at your facility and you want to use five mil, you just have to make sure you use five mil all the time. Uh, consistency is more key 
being consistent across the industry again everyone's going to have a one mil or two mil pet around so those are my preferences perfect all right well that's that's all we have for questions um, as part of our q a for today's webinar uh there will be a copy of this sent out to all attendees so if you'd like to listen to um, or replay certain segments of this presentation um, that information will be made available to you and um, as always we appreciate your time and we wish everybody a very happy holiday and we'll be coming back to you with our, our next webinar in 2021. Thanks again.